Good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all enjoying lunch. Uh, looks like there's still a lot of food over there, so if you want to load your plates one more time before we get started with the afternoon speaker. Uh, I'm Renee Legrade. You all met me earlier, and it looks like everybody from the symposium is here right now, right? Is there anyone who wasn't at the symposium? Darn it, there's always one. Um, <laughs> so rather than going and giving another really lengthy introduction to Donovan, Shannon suggested I just keep it short and cut to the chase so that you would have plenty of time to speak. So th thank you, Donovan, for your wonderful conversation with Shannon a few minutes ago over at the Sandoz Center. Um, and now uh, I'd like to say thank you again for being available to come give the lunch presentation. Uh, really looking forward to this because I always do exactly what Shannon tells me to do. Uh, she also, we are also really quite pleased that your talk is on the Battle of the Little Bighorn because volume two of the Sando series will be coming out uh, one year from now. We have all the manuscript in, and it is also on the Battle of the Biddle, uh, Little Bighorn. So six essays that take very innovative looks at the battle through very different perspectives. But that's just as a way to promote the volume uh, and to help introduce you. So thank you very much, and welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, good to see you back again. And uh, a couple things I wanted to mention also, you know, I, you know, I didn't mention the Little Bighorn book of uh, Mary Sandos, but very interesting book, you know, and, and I've always been a collector of stuff, uh, so I kind of looked in my files and, and that, and uh, so uh, what I had, and so I, I did bring this along. I got a table up here, some of my books, and the artifacts over there are from, uh, from northern Nebraska and spear points. And uh, I've, had the, I've got those a long time ago when I was a kid at a, a ranch auction. So they're right in the area of where uh, our people had, our family had camps. Also, I uh, told Shannon about this. I, I brought in a, uh, a book here. And uh, there's an article in here. Mary was uh, was uh, at a symposium herself in uh, I think it was Wisconsin, and the whole article is in here with the the program from back in the day. And then she gave a presentation, and this is her signature on here. She was I guess she was in this room English 101. Tuesdays and Thursdays, room 73. And uh, the article is pretty extensive in here from the city itself about the conference, and the conference program is in here. And, and then it's signed, it says, uh, warm regards, uh, Helen Stolfer. Um, so, you know, she did this. And then I have one um, signed by, uh, uh, Miss Sandoz also, and I didn't bring that when I was kind of in a rush, but I did bring that to the center one time, and I was pretty sure it was her signature uh, because it was in the, the fountain ink like and uh, kind of that light blue color and pretty unique, you know, looking signature. But I checked with them, and yeah, they said, yep, that's definitely hers. But um, eh, they, I think they see quite a few of those, so they, you know, um, were very familiar with that. Also have uh, uh, some informa other uh, information here. This is, I talked about the rare indigenous eyewitness account of the Battle of Little Bighorn found in Ontario, and that's the letter I was talking about that was written in uh, uh, foreign language and uh, verified that there were, that's the one with, uh, was returned to Tawa Dushno. So that old story is in there. And any other things I'll have down at the, uh, uh, my table here. Um, this one is not down there yet, but there were a couple famous drawings back in the day, paintings of the uh, of the the battle, and I know you've seen these, and they look pretty uh, stereotypical, like 
Custer's always the last one down, and with his, uh, often with his saber, which most of the sabers were left behind, you know, at Fort Abraham Lincoln. And uh, up on the Custer Hill, there were two classic ones. But this one by Paxson, along with that, uh, with the research of when he did this back in the early 1900s, uh, he meticulously researched characters. So I have another one with the, the numbers on each person of who they are. So they, they really are certain people. So um, they, they're, they're certain soldiers are, are done, identified in there. And for instance, right behind Custer here is Hump. And uh, right over here is Crazy Horse. And, and so a lot of people anyway didn't know. They just thought, well, he's just drawing, you know, different images. But he really did uh, talk to other natives. Um, and, and then this is like a drawing of it here with the numbers. The, the code so you can find that. So um, I talked about winter counts as well. I also have the book here, um, The Year the Stars Fell, is uh, full of winter counts from the Smithsonian. So um, that's the ones that they, they possess. So a lot can be learned from all of that. Um, so with the uh, information that I have here, um, the, the, the Little Bighorn, a couple of the new things that's new there. I uh, don't have time to, you know, even tell you all the, the, the different aspects of the battle. There's so many different things in books written about that. And a lot of people want to know, you know, what, what kind of bullets were used and how many were fired and stuff like that. But, you know, there is individual research you could spend a whole uh, you know, program just on that. But I think one of the things that really rewrote uh, the book or, shed, or rewrote history and shed more light on it was the archaeological work after the fire uh, in the early 80s, around eight, 1983. And the fire, um, you know, broke out there. And at first, you know, they thought, what a terrible thing. But then they decided to go over that with, um, uh, you know, shoulder to shoulder with, with metal detectors, and they found a lot of things, you know, there um, that, you know, established skirmish lines and, and where um, people fired from and uh, what kind of uh, weaponry was used from the bullets. They even matched up some of the shell casings with then where the bullet ended up, you know, things like that. So, uh, you know, that's beyond anything, whatever, anything that we ever heard about that. And it didn't, it didn't really appear in the winter counts either because that was more recent history and, and people feared uh, repercussion, uh, talking about too much of this back in the early days, say late 1800s and, and early 1900s. And uh, my grandfather, who I mentioned, Hump, was interviewed by Walter Camp. And so, um, and, and Camp actually said that uh, he liked his account um, as well or better than all the people that he talked to. Uh, so, but I can read through that. And they also interviewed other family members who told basically the same thing, but when they were real pressed for specifics, like maybe names, they wouldn't give that out because, like I said, they feared repercussion. And so they would change the subject. So it's kind of interesting in interviews, uh, they change the subject, you know, well, I, I do know it was a pretty warm day and the sun was kind of high, but, you know, and there were a few clouds, but not too many. And, you know, the kind of, and then they'll come back and focus on a specific question, you know, and they'll talk a little bit, but then, well, yeah, there, there were a few clouds, you know, and it's like, okay, uh, change the subject. I'm un uncomfortable with answering that. They didn't, they didn't say that. So um, one, one of the, uh, Cheyenne referred to this incident uh, on the Rosebud. All of this is like with my college talking about resources and going places to visit. I can go uh, 15 minutes and I'm over to the Fort Phil Kearney site of the Fetterman fight and the wagon box fight. And uh, it's about uh, 
30, 40 minutes up to the Rosebud, this site here, and it's about uh, 50 minutes into the Battle of the Little Bighorn site, about 50 minutes into the Dull Knife site, and then the three forts that were established there uh, along the Bozeman Trail were Fort C.F. Smith, Fort Phil Kearney, and Fort Reno all along the Bozeman Trail. And uh, so I go out there also. Um, the, uh, the Fort Reno is over east of KC, Wyoming, about uh, 30 miles, and about 30 miles the other direction to the west is into the Dull Knife uh, battle site. Um, so um, then up at Fort Phil Kearney, that's right at Story, south of Sheridan, and then C.F. Smith is up uh, kind of southwest of uh, Lodge Grass, Montana, just into Montana. So you, you have those three forts uh, spread out along there, and uh, this would precede the, the Little Bighorn from June 17th, 1876. So right in Sheridan itself, I can go down to the park. I mean, we have, not to mention, uh, buffalo jumps all around, right one right in town there where they stampeded buffalo off cliffs, you know, and a lot of archaeological work done by um, Dr. George Frism, was a, a state archaeologist who just of Wyoming just passed a couple years ago, and he wrote extensively and studied on all these sites. Right, right at the college, we have artifacts right there in the um, in the college from from those sites. But right in um, right right in the camp there, uh, the maps show some of the area that I'm talking about uh, right here, and and we're right down here. Here's Fort Robinson. So there's the Dull Knife and the Wagon Box, Fetterman, the uh, Rosebud over here, Little Bighorn, and Sheridan's over in, in this area here. But the, the famous uh, Camp Cloud Peak was right in Sheridan, and that's where General Crook set up his uh, headquarters there on the Goose River. There's a big goose and little goose runs through the town. And what that was really was a big arms buildup in preparation for what would become some of these wars. So that's kind of what's going on. A lot of the arms are coming from uh, from down at Fort uh, 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 to Laramie up to Reno, and then uh, wagon trains coming into there. So after the big uh, buildup, then uh, the the three prong attack is is coming in. So Custer is coming from Fort Abraham Lincoln and then Crook down here, and then another uh, contingent were, were up here at Fort Ellis in Montana, and eventually they would all come together at the, the Little Bighorn is where people would be found. And just some other details and about that is that Crook had to wait for some of his uh, his scouts that were coming from over here, like some of the Shoshone and some of them to join him, and then he's going to uh, go in there. So he comes in to uh, up to the Rosebud site, and uh, they'll have you know a pretty big battle over there most of the day, and, and they'll uh, they'll retreat. They'll they'll come back to Sheridan to the Camp Cloud Peak, and so uh, that's been a lot of controversy about all that because he was supposed to meet up with Custer, you know, days later on, on June 25th. So. He has about one, about a thousand men, and some of those scouts, probably about, you know, about 1,400 uh, people who are supposed to be at the battle, you know, itself. And so battle happens, and one value of all this, too, is not only our, our winter counts that I use, but uh, there's a lot of soldier diaries and stuff, you know, and there's newspaper correspondents who travel, you know, with some of these people keeping day-to-day -day, uh, records. So we always know the a lot of the soldier side, a lot more of that than the native side. I mean, we get the soldiers that, yeah, they went there, they went to West Point, they were in the Civil War, they in the Civil War battle, their father was Civil War, but, you know, I mean, all kinds of stuff. And then for the native side, what, what you get for all of this is Red Cloud's War. Okay, we got them covered. We, we told the the native side of it right there. And once Red Cloud uh, surrenders, that person who will be left out uh, out there is City Hall. So then it's 
City and Bow and Warriors. So most of the time they have no idea of the mixture of bands that they're encountering here. And what they're encountering with our group, our family, is Lakota and Cheyenne. I, I might not have mentioned that I'm one half Cheyenne. And the, the wives of Hump were from Morning Star, were from the Dolmai family. So that's the connection there that will come into play here later in this presentation. So anyway, they go back to, uh, to the Cloud Peak camp and then, okay, there, what's going on in the diary? We look back, uh, Little Bighorn happens, no crook shows up. Um, what's, what's he doing? The diary says, oh, I'm over here where Bighorn is, is right south of Sheridan. Over here, I'm uh, fishing. The fishing is awesome, it's great, we're having a wonderful time. Whoops, Custer's getting killed right then. So some people wonder, you know, well, what would have happened, you know, with, uh, with over a thousand more people, they all come. And so our people say, well, it would have just taken a little bit longer, you know, a few more minutes, but um, who knows. So the, our people, the Cheyenne, always refer to this, my chapter in my, my unpublished book is called The Battle Where Sister Saved Your Brother. And that's from the Cheyenne. And uh, when uh, this man looked like he was facing certain death, a woman came over the road over the hill, right down through the, the middle of where the main uh, uh, bottle is today. This is a, a buffalo jump up there. She kind of come in to the, to the west, rode in. Finest regalia, so there's this drawing that was created for that. Soldiers are all shooting, and she sweeps down and, and rescues, it's her brother, and saves him. So that's how the Cheyenne refer to this battle. Like Rosebud, see, that's a, that's a modern name for the creek, and then my students are totally confused because of uh, Rosebud Reservation. It's like, what, you know, now you're talking Montana? Uh, but anyway, brothers over here, there's a, uh, he just clamped onto the side. His arm is across here, and his carbine is right there, and his face is right there. Just his face is peeking out that side. And then away they went over the hill, and he saved him. And I said they got over to safety, and not a high five going on, you know. Yes, yes, yes. And they're, uh, they made it. So that's how that story is. There's a story and explanation, you know, for all of that. Uh, so this shows the three-pronged attack here coming from uh, Fort Lincoln, uh, south of Mandan. Uh, out here, Terry Custer call you, and then Gibbon call him, coming from Fort Ellis, which I mentioned this way, and then Crook, who doesn't, who doesn't show up. So uh, I guess I should uh, back up here to this here. The, the big news out there uh, for all of you is that the, the visitor center is coming down in a, in a few weeks. They're going to start tearing it down and dismantling that. And for a long time, it, it was it was needed uh, to have a bigger facility and just a fraction of, of the artifacts and things are there. So they always needed the money part. And I think I'm pretty sure it was a, a woman from Sheridan just put the money up and said, OK, you need a center, here you go. And uh, so anyway, uh, that'll be completely dismantled by, by this winter. And so this is still sitting there back in the corner. On uh, one side they have all of the, uh, the soldier side right here, if you go in the museum there. And it's got Custer, you know, and all of the, the main players uh, on that side. And then this is on our side. This is the native side here, usually City Bow, who uh, predicted the victory, and they had the uh, Sundance, which foretold uh, soldiers falling into camp, and they predicted a big victory. It happened over um, in the area of the Rosebud prior. Um, so he's often, although he, he was not, he's a medicine man, he was not a, a veteran of like the battle fighting and that. In fact, his job was to get the women and children to safety as the attack came. And uh, this is Hull, my great-great-grandfather here. I have an uh, original picture of this. Uh, he was photographed by L.A. Huffman, the famous uh, photographer from Miles City. Because see, that's where that Tongue River Cantonment was, up there by Miles City, 
where he surrendered. And the actual picture I showed him up there, this is cropped. So the real picture, which may be in here somewhere, uh, has his two Cheyenne wives next to him. And then it has, he's holding a, uh, a war club that was used, he used that in the battle. And he's seated, and his, uh, the one wife is standing here, and his sister, and then my great-great-grandmother, her sister, is seated next to him. And he's got a, uh, he's sitting down in a chair. And on his, uh, on his knee is a, a big flat brim hat, big letters that says hump on there, as if you didn't know who he was. So Crazy Horse, a nice little drawing of him because of no proven picture. Um, so these are some uh, Red Horse, Minikoju, drew images of the, um, of the battle later that were very uh, helpful. And uh, PZ, or Gaul, from the Hoop Papa was very uh, prominent there. And uh, Rain in the Face were some of those. And there, was, uh, there were also women involved. It was important that women also served and be recognized. So I give credit to the women also in, in my book. One of the uh, women, after the battle was all over, they, uh, she, she wrote, uh, she was from Hoop Papa, moving robe woman. And uh, she said, I seen the men of our nation circling the hill. The soldiers were all, were all gone, were, lay, were laying there. And she said, I seen Gaul, I seen Crazy Horse, Hump, Rain in the Face. And the man croaking was, had the, the 7th Cavalry banner. He was, uh, they were going in a circle around there, just parading. That's, that was the final uh, scene there. And I, I want to uh, get this out too before uh, you all get mad at me for uh, for us being victorious in all of these battles. That fifty percent of American Indians are veterans of U.S. wars, and no ethnic group in America comes anywhere close to that. We serve in the highest numbers, and that started with World War One and continues to this day. I gave a, a talk over a bit to like Fort Knox and overseas and, and uh, places like that and, and gave that. When I was first at Fort Knox, that was a long time ago, and CNN covered that and the stats were coming. That night I was in my quarters, they put me in, and uh, that, the stats were coming right across on, on the news there. And so uh, today uh, I actually heard the president last summer making statements, you know, about veterans or whatever. And my very uh, exactly quoted, you know, stats and sentence came out of his mouth. So I said, well, you know, if you talk about this history long enough, you know, it, it catches on. Or, and, and I'm not saying anything about political parties. That's a whole other uh, battle, <laughs> I'd say. Uh, so anyway, I'm real proud of this. I, every time I go into the museum, we go over and we stand, you know, by this, and our people get our pictures, and usually creates a big photo session. We're talking about um, Shannon's books, or our book is at the Little Big Horn, and mine, which I have available over here, are all there uh, side by side. And every time I go in there, it creates a big unscheduled book signing, you know. They, and I'll, I'll sign a bunch of books, you know, like. Um, you know, stack about this high, and I come back, you know, two weeks later, and I say, "Well, oh, sign our books here," and I say, "I oh, was just here. I signed all that. No, that's a whole other batch there. You know, we we got rid of all those." Um, so this is uh, this is uh, Crook's camp, very well depicted. Like Sheridan is right here. The the library is right here. This is the big horns here, and uh, I actually have a. Harper's uh, Weekly of the Shoshone Scouts coming right off the steep hill here to join them. And, and they're actually arriving right here. And, and this is the order, but a, a big, big arms buildup and then the layout here. So uh, this will lead next to the little Bighorn Mountain itself. They'll find a, a large camp. The Crow Scouts will locate those. Um, over at a, uh, 
on, on one of the, the hills there, they observed a lot of uh, pony dust of the large herds of which they're, eas they're easily, it sounds like a large number, but there could have been up to 10,000 horses that were grazing over in that area because the headmen had very large herds. So that's, it's over if you've been up, going up to 12th and the battlefield is off to your right side, and there's a town of uh, Gary Owen that's right there in the south. But it was right west of Gary Owen is where all those were, that herd was facing. And so, uh, of course, Custer will split his command again into, uh, he'll send Reno to the south area. And I've ruled some of this part here. This is, this is the part from the Rosebud on their trek through here, this valley. They rode right through here in Crozer that tell the story today because they have land in that area and the Crow Reservation is there. So they um, they know that as they came over towards the Little Bighorn, Custer had his, his uh, plans changed because, um, well, first of all, some of uh, one of the wagons that had some of the heart attack and food on it, um, they, had, they told that they had lost some, some stuff fell off, some bags, and uh, the officer said, you go right back there and get that right now because there's there's the enemy in the area and they'll detect that and see that. So uh, they went back to the area and when they got there, the enemy was was eating that, some of the warriors. They took off on a run. So then that's the first point they knew that this, they're gonna be uh, discovered and known. And so that pushes the clock up by one day They'll decide to go in, and um, so this is the, the Little Bighorn River um, itself. Uh, looks just like that. Um, our camps were were down in this area of the Minicoju, and it's called uh, Minicoju Ford today. It's a real accessible place as far as the river going back and forth this way, and, and the others are just the route over to that. Uh, these are some of the markers that were actually located. They were once lost. This is out where Reno is told to, to attack the south end. So he'll, he'll attack the south end, and then Ben Team will go further to the south to search for an enemy, and he won't find anybody. He'll eventually come back and find Reno engaged on that south end. Meanwhile, Custer has went to the north on north on that on the ridge and uh, he last they seen of him he had a, a hat he waved a, a white hat down below and they noticed that and then so that's where kind of the mystery begins on the non-indian side was what what all happened after that uh, but i don't think it's a big mystery as much as people say it is because our people have a lot of accounts of it and where they were, but piece, just piece that all together. But it seems more like it has to be told from another culture's side or something to, to really be the real deal or something, because they don't they want to listen to maybe to the oral accounts or the, the drawings. And the markers were rediscovered. That's on the, the Reno attack. So uh, this is where Reno comes in on the south end and these there were about three people. They, they had markers for them, um, and then they lost it in the farmer's field, and the farmer uh, found them later, so they marked them again. Uh, so these are some of the drawings uh, from the native side here, and uh, this is the last stand hill here. So then what we've been talking about here, here's the Little Bighorn River, and the camps are down in here. Uh, a lot, a lot of the, the order they say of, of soldiers and that isn't always just uh, where where the people were because when they visited like this, they only come together for Sundance, uh, greatest religious gathering, and that never that many people in, in one place. So when I in my uh, Writing, you know, I say Custer came in on the biggest religious gathering of the year. Was really what was going on, and because the area couldn't sustain large, uh, 
herds of horses and people like that, they, they could only stay a while and had to go break up in the bands and leave. But for Sundance, see, it starts on the solstice, June 21st, and it goes four days, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th. Esther comes in, it's the 25th, and the camps are breaking up. See, they're moving. They're all disbanding and leaving. And he speeds everything up, like I said, and says, let's go on in. They're getting away, you know. The teepees are coming down. The driveways are leaving. So everything is, is so hurry, hurry, hurry up. And, you know, I feel sorry for those horses, those soldier horses, for that, that march of, uh, from the Rosebud clear over, you know, say you got, you know, 30 miles there, and, and, uh, and then they hit that, and then they, everything's moved forward by a day, and uh, a race, you know, and those horses had to be so uh, wore out and exhausted, you know. Uh, so our camps were, um, were, were up in here by the Cheyenne. This, this is a mini Koju Ford, which is kind of flat right here. There's a, today there's a reenactment of the real bird family right in, in that area. And then um, when Custer comes in on the end over here from the Rosebud, comes across, this is looking north this way, uh, this is where Reno will come in and make his attack. And every uh, fourth man will hold the horses and they'll, they'll uh, skirmish there. And uh, the way of fighting was much different. It's like Civil War, you know, you, you line up, line, line by line and men by men and shoot and fire and then you move forward and hold another line. Well, that didn't fit or work with the natives because ours, ours was more circular and uh, they described the great horsemanship, you know, circling and, and hanging on the side of a horse just like, uh, like the one who was rescued there, you know, by a sister and it's all over the, the horse. And men didn't have, warriors didn't have saddles, you know, they, they used sinew and that women, women had saddles, but they were the best horsemen that the soldiers had ever seen. Pretty soon you get going in a circle like that, you know, and, and everything gets, you know, confusing and uh, out of the order. So eventually, they're after all these horses here. That's always the prize, even if it's an enemy tribe, get those horses. So that's what they're doing is routing those horses. And then the horses will begin to uh, stampede right into the camp itself. The, the handlers cannot hold those. And there goes the ammunition because the saddlebags are full of the ammunition. Reno will make a decision to retreat back up to this hill up here. So several are killed leaving retreat. So they, they come in here, these arrows show that, that retreat. And some hid in these trees here and even uh, through the whole battle end of the next day, they didn't know that they were in those trees. But most of them came up here and it was described as about 100 degrees that day, hot, and there's no trees up here, so they're like um, sitting ducks. This uh, other area, that shows the, the last stand hill. With, with our family, uh, this, this chapter of my book is called The Music of the Bugles, because yeah, our family was down in this area, and I mentioned the music of the bugles, our um, uh, women were up on the top, um, picking teams up and prairie turnip, and that's when they heard the sound of the bugles of the soldiers, and they ran screaming back to the camp. That was the first that our group knew that it was soldiers were in the area on time. So uh, immediately, uh, once they alerted uh, Crazy Horse and and Hump were down here in this area here, and they crossed over here and went down along this ridge, and they got in on just the, the ending of the Reno uh, fight, because the Reno fight only lasted about 20 minutes, and he's overrun and dug in up on top. And so um, they were all pointing to the north. They said, more up there, you knocked me, you know, to go up, oh, go up 
to the north, there's uh, soldiers going that way. So they're making kind of like inroads, but this is very steep here to check and see where they're at and back, because this, this is the real uh, traversable area here. Go up here and see where they are. They're moving, uh, moving this way. And then up here at Calhoun Hill, the last stand hill is just right here. That's where some of the real fierce fighting took place that turned the tide in the, in the battle. Some of that is stuff I could rewrite and not rewrite, but I can add more to the, the history uh, of what happened. Yeah, if we get back up there. Uh, so back to Calhoun Hill. So some of that fits in with Walter Camp's story too. He talked to uh, Hump about that. But what was known about that area was some of the fiercest fighting took place, which changed a lot of the, the outcome type, uh, you know, uh, of the battle type. Uh, uh, so uh, Hump and Crazy Horse and others had split the column up on the top of that hill, and that's described quite a bit and with the Crazy Horse writings. They rode right through, they talked about how the bullets couldn't touch him, and he turned back around and came back through and the soldiers were all up there on the top of the ridge at Cal Boone Hill, and they're squatted down, aiming, and they, um, as Hump comes up, they, uh, they shoot him in the, in, in the knee, and the bullet travels all the way up his leg and exits out his hip, and, and the horse jumps into the air and falls over backwards. So he's laying there partially, pinned in that and so with the crazy horse people too they it, it all fits with uh, the crazy horse and others made a corridor around hump there to protect him while they're bringing another horse and he's uh, you know getting his collecting himself and all that and uh, the other one hump's brother there his name is little crow and he's not the little crow from minnesota uh, history but anyway, they brought another horse, and the other thing that fits in chronologically right around this time is, uh, is the man, Lane White Man. He was in the picture of the participants there. He's a famous Cheyenne chief, and Hump's brother, Little Crow, accidentally killed him in, in the, right, right around that time, and they thought he was uh, a, a, a Rickera scout. He had a soldier jacket, and his hair was loose, so his marker was put up there. It was in the wrong place for, for quite a few decades. And then they, they marked those with cards like rock, the, our people, and then they go back and then the ranger superintendent has those removed. And then they come back, here's those rocks again. So they finally, finally told them what those were for, so now they leave them alone. But anyway, they know the exact site, so that, that happens within minutes of uh, with with the history. And then, then from there, over like looking here would be like on Calhoun Hill, and then over to Last Stand Hill is just kind of how now people are running at that time. Many have lost their horses from, or some were wounded on Calhoun Hill, and that's where today you find a lot of the markers, which soldier markers, which aren't all in the exact place, but a lot of uh, proliferation, large proliferation of markers all the way to that hill. And the way our people uh, described it in family was it was they likened it to the buffalo hunt where um, you would break off uh, the herd, you know, into smaller groups, and that's what they were doing, how they described with the soldiers, they would separate them and split them off like that. Number one thing is to go for the, uh, the, the horses itself. So uh, later then, the, 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 the work would continue uh, over at Last Stand Hill. And again, the fire that happened um, rewrote a lot of the story. I know some of the elders used to say, some of the Cheyenne used to say they fought down by the current visitor center that they're taking. Now that's why, they're going to move that down by the highway because it's on, you know, the artifact stuff there. But uh, historians wouldn't believe them. They said, no, I don't believe that. You know, it all ended at Last Stand Hill. Well, after the fire, 
they found out, yeah, those people knew what they were talking about. There was fighting and skirmish down at the visitor center where that is, and then a lot more of a last rush up to the last stand hill, and then in the final minutes there was some desperation, like they went off from last stand hill, a few of them down in what's called Deep Ravine today, which is to the southwest of the hill. And when they got down there, that's like a hornet's nest. Some of the younger ones, boys in that, who had been holding fresh horses and water in case, you know, as that was needed, that was their job not to be in the, the battle itself. Well, those people at Flint came right down into that group there. So they're still looking for those bodies. Uh, you know, there's a book called the uh, e troop, you know, uh, they described, the natives described those two, uh, units by color of their horses. Those were, a lot of them were gray horses. So there's still a mystery today, and they're, they're still looking for that. I was at an uh, archaeological, well, actually, it was this uh, fox was over there that was wrote the book on the, after the fire. But we, we just crossed paths at the Rosebud. And they were down there looking for bodies that were never found from where Crook set up his command. And they were they were in the right area. And while I was there, I actually um, help them. It was really hot. I felt sorry for his uh, uh, guy his, that was doing all the digging. And it was hot. And I said, I'll take that shovel for a while. Here we found uh, three three pieces of the same pistol right there, no pistol. So. It had serial number on it too, so they, they were taking that up to Billings to see, you know, more about that type of stuff. But that's what it is about. It's like pieces and pieces and picking up. So let's go forward here. We can, Shannon. Um, I won't talk about the, uh, back up to the people. Okay, uh, here's sitting bull here, and uh, this is uh, uh, Little Wolf and Dull Life there. And there's, there's the original picture, I was telling you, of Hump with his hat and club. And my great great grandmother is to his left. And then our man, and he, he wasn't at the particular battle, but that's Touch the Cloud, who was known for his height. And he, he took care of Crazy Horse down here when he was stabbed on the parade ground over here. And he is, when he surrendered, his agency was. Uh, was the Spotted Tail Agency, although he's a mini so he's a, he's a first cousin. We have seven footers in our family still today from from that line. And uh, so with with these surrenders then, uh, this will, after the battle happens, uh, there will be five surrenders from our family, which I'll, I'll talk more about uh, in a little bit. Okay, this is, uh, that's moving role mentioned and these are Rick Ross scouts here and uh, Comanche the, the well-known horse that survived the battle that came back to me always got that confused I was trying to say that was Custer's but it wasn't his and that one uh, is on display still down at uh, Kansas the University you might, you might know that let's go to the, the next one and then uh, Custer uh, I spoke over at the Custer Week as a, in Monroe, Michigan. So they have an annual Custer Week, you know, all the Custer fans and big blowout. So I was going to be a keynote speaker one year, so I was kind of wondering what would happen to me and all the <laughs> Really nice people, you know. I even came back with a, with a bow that the Custers are still there. Um, we, I spoke in an old theater right on Main Street. Right across the street was a boot shop that was even uh, still going. It was owned by the, some of the Custer relatives. The last day I was there, some of the Custer family came in on the farm and gave me a bowl uh, from out, uh, out here. They don't know whose it is, but when the widows went back from Fort Abraham Lincoln, they, they took stuff with them, and they said, this bowl belongs out there with, with you guys. And so uh, real, really nice people. And uh, Gory, this is kind of like Gory details, Godfrey, he was one of the commanders. Uh, 
stuff like Wood Lake, the Cheyenne. He had great accounts, you know, of names. I like those names they mentioned because, like I said, you know, this is like a city bull and warriors show here, and it wasn't just that. But Wooden Lake said he got an uh, unusual scalp that day, and it was actually his Godfrey Cypress was what he got, and we're hanging on his belt. Uh, next one, that's the famous message to Benteen, uh, make, uh, bring packs, uh, be quick, bring packs. He said that twice and had all the ammo, that was the last message. Uh, the, one of the guidance here, one of those was, uh, there, there were several that they had, so it's more of stuff like this. Let's go to the next one, that will maybe be in the new center. Uh, same way here. Let's go to the next one. Uh, these, this is the crow side here, and then all that is is leading participants. That's what the the little bighorn um, monument presents today. Is basically the people I just showed you uh, the, on the soldier side and the native side. Uh, next one. Uh, these are just some more pictures here. Speaking, I think that was actually 150th anniversary. The battle I was talking up there. Old postcards there. Next one, please. Um, okay, the, that's the uh, cemetery down below, and the building that's coming down is next to that. Next. Okay, that just shows the location. Like I said, the crow tell a lot of the story of. A bar of the history, our, our people, our families didn't see this area in, in later years. They were now at the uh, Pine Ridge Reservation, uh, Rosebud, uh, Standing Rock, Cheyenne River, and Lower Rule. So we have Ogallala, this, this nation Ogallala, Sichangu, uh, Papa, Standing Rock, uh, Minikoju, Sia Sapa, Uwea Nupa, all of that is a part of our, our nation. These are pictures from back in the day. Uh, this is the, the valley here. When this part of the story here is after it's over, I'll kind of conclude with that. But um, our, the family went south where Gary Owen is in the Big Horser. They went down. Um, Adjacent to I-90, they're on the west side. There's an old Indian trail that goes down. They went to Lodgegrass, Montana. So this open field is right by the interstate, and Lodgegrass would be to the right. But they they camped in this green meadow the first night, and they they buried some of the dead, cared for some of the wounded, and Hump and Crazy Horse were part of this. And so in this. Uh, overhang cliff there was archaeological work done there they actually uncovered a lot of the skulls in this whole area eventually farmers did uh, one of the farmers had several of those about as far apart as his windows there he put them on his fence posts and then they used it for target practice that that generation you know uh, and then later they uh, found out you know more of the story uh, so a lot of artifacts were found there directly from the battle itself that were taken in. Soldier buttons, and what they did, they dressed up and played soldier when they left. So there's some real accurate uh, paintings of that after the battle. The younger ones especially, there's pictures, just drawings of them putting the soldier pants on and, and dressing up with the uniform and uh, got a flag guiding and two columns, and they're playing soldier. You know, they're checking all this out, just you know, looking at each other. So that's part of what it looked like when, it, when they were leaving. So as they were leaving down there by Gary Owen, there's some noise, it's like they're hollering, hey, over here, over here. And here it is, it's some of those of Reno that had dug in and didn't go up there with him. They'd even stuck, a uh, fire was set down in that area also. But they were down like in their gopher holes hid. 
and they thought these were the soldiers coming in to help them, and they didn't know it was, you know, warriors. So our warriors had already decided to leave, but they went in there and, and um, laid in a few volleys, and, and they went back to their squirrel holes pretty quick, gopher holes. And, and so that was part of the story. They continued on, spent the first night here, oh, that's about, it's under 20 miles. And, and on their way, they're following the Big Horn River, goes on down. And then it comes into the Tongue River, and that's the main camp of uh, Hump and Crazy Horse during these decades. That's from about Miles City down to Dayton, the Tongue River. And uh, all of these engagements happen like right off the Tongue, and uh, that's where they find it. So anyway, they go on down to uh, Dayton, so north of Dayton, to the Tongue. They'll spend a few weeks there, and Crazy Horse will leave. He'll take his group on west, and he'll continue into the Powder River Basin over towards uh, Bear Lodge, Devil's Tower area. And then that fall in September 1876 will be the Battle of uh, Slim Beauties up in north uh, western South Dakota and Crooks over there now and it sends Anson Mills into an attack. So uh, he comes in on, on the attack and by then Hump has come in west also and so it's the first time since uh, since Lodgegrass that Hump and Crazy Horse come together. They come together over there and there are quite a ways, well actually a day's ride west Battle of Slim Butte, so they missed out on that. But runners came because that was the camp of Iron Plume. It's in history, it's American horse, but it's Iron Plume. And um, so they they sent word, you know, hey, we need help. You know, uh, but by the time they got there, it's like the books say, uh, the crooks uh, and mills were far down. The time was about four miles, and some of these new warriors came in and just kind of tapped the south end and, and, and gave it up. It's real muddy and foggy, and there's pictures of that. And, and Crook and Ants and Mills, they get lost. They, they end up over at the Deer's Ears Buttes, which is my, my uncle's ranch over there. There's still, you know, canteens and stuff, you know, they find over there. And then they, they steered in the right direction after the fog lifted and went right straight into Deadwood. So they were on a route southeast, and then they, they turned. So these are actual things that were found in that uh, lodge grass around the cliffs there. Let's do the next one, a watch. Um, and I'm not sure um, if I have any more artifacts of that. So let's go forward and see if there's any more. No, nope. um, I'll stop there. But anyway, uh, the other thing that was found there was a feral from the soldiers uh, for the, the 7th Cavalry banner. So uh, with a wood, part of the wood piece broke off. So they have that. And so then at St. Slim Buttes, they found a lot of the booty over there from the Little Bighorn. Remember, uh, there's always that, that picture, and I have it over here. And it's the 7th Cavalry banner was, was found flying out the book say the, the Lodge of American Horse, Iron Blue. Uh, and so I always wondered out there now with, with some of those guidance, if there's one broke, see, that would fit the other piece. Yeah. You know, but that, that's part of the uh, detective work, I guess you'd say. So could I answer any, um, any questions? Like I guess said, there's so many uh, faucets of this. And I, I do have a little big horn, horn National Monument brochure, which you know has has numbers and all that. There were about you know 260 or so is what they give that were um, there at the battle killed. Yes. I was wondering with the formation of the teepees that it shows on that map, is that fairly accurate? Well, yeah, it's it's pretty accurate there, but. Um, the, the tribes are always is after it. A lot of them said, well, no, we weren't in that location. We were down further. What the maps always have is clearly the Cheyenne on the north, the Minikoju next, and uh, 
uh, CHO new, and the uh, home pop up always at the south end. That means campers at the end of the circle. But they found a lot of them were up north visiting. And when you gather first um, on that Sundance, and those big gatherings, first thing you did was a visit with others. You went to other, you didn't stick so much with your own groups. And then there were some Arapaho in there too. That's the Arapaho connection. They were over there hunting, and by some accounts that I interviewed people courting as well. And they got caught up in it. It's like, whoa, we're, we're right in the middle of a battle now. So they were, it wasn't like intended. But like with Crooks, he was, he was totally waiting for those Shoshone, and then the Crow people went in. And uh, uh, another thing I wanted to mention that's big news is that our tribes, uh, our tribe, Minikoshu, took 51% uh, interest, and we now own land on the battlefield itself. As of uh, last year, I gave uh, a presentation to the chairman. It's down on Reno Creek on the south end. So my whole program was about, okay, what happened right on this land in Reno Creek? We're focusing on that. Reno comes in on one side of the creek, Custer's on the other side. He sends Reno to the north to, to that attack. Another thing that's out there is called the Lone Teepee. That's a story on the south end. Lone Teepee was, as they're coming across from the Rosebud, the, uh, the crows, our enemies, observed this, these uh, Lakota, Cheyenne, are at this teepee. And they run them out of there, and they burn the teepee. You know, we're, we're getting our our guns and ready. But what they did—that that's known to be a Mitazi show. That's one of our seven Lakota. Some of Hump's band were there, so they were having a funeral for the deceased in there from Rosebud. And so you know, it's different way to look at it. The crows burned that and broke up, broke that up. And the books would just say, oh, I've seen the enemy and kind of rousted them out of there. The other thing that's right down to the east of that tribal land, and, uh, and we don't really believe this, but you know, anyway, there's what's called a crazy horse petroglyph, or it's a drawing, and it was believed to have made, he made that after the battle. And you might have seen it. It's a, it's a horse, and he's on the horse, and there's a, a long snake attached. And it's it's now rude. It caved in, and it's gone. But in the early '60s, let's see. I knew uh, not uh, not Frizen, but another guy came down here, worked with uh, Jesse Sundstrom and Custer, and oh, Glenn Sween. He's a famous, pretty well known Wyoming history. And he studied all that. He actually had replicas made of that, and they they sold them to at museums. But uh, our people say that was a Shoshone thing with that snake on there, you know, the snakes. And but they uh, others, you'll see more about that. There's some articles coming out that want to say that that was crazy horses. Anyway, any other questions? Well, I think yes, there's one or two more, but I'm going to have you talk with them on the way back okay. in order to keep, yeah, uh, keep with the, the program. Flow. So please walk back with Donovan, ask your questions. Okay. And to, okay. you can buy books over here. Yes, yes. yes. Thank you. Please, yeah. buy, please uh, take a look at the book. They are. Uh, thank you. And I just want to see the artifacts over here are from northern Nebraska. I, I bought that myself back in the day when I was a kid. I took the back off because they put the glass on the front and then they kind of built it themselves, but they put a newspaper in there. So I have the full newspaper, it's, it's and the Nebraska town, and uh, they, it was framed and figured, framed then in the 1890s. And one of the, there's interesting ads in there. There's even a, a looks like a, a bicycle on a chair and it's got, looks like uh, Jetsons or something. It's got a, a propeller up there, and it's a woman's hair dryer. So, 